Hello everyone from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services National Conservation Training Center in Shepherdstown, West Virginia. My name is Ashley Fortune and I would like to welcome you to today's broadcast of the NCC WSC's Climate Change Science and Management Webinar Series. This series is held in partnership with the U.S. Geological Survey's National Climate Change and Wildlife Science Center. Our speakers today are Shad O'Neill with the USGS Alaska Science Center and Aaron Hood with the University of Alaska Southeast. And they will be presenting From Ice Field to Ocean, Impacts of Glacial Change in Alaska. Before we introduce our speakers, I would like to remind you that all of your phones are currently on a global mute and they will continue to be so throughout the duration of the presentation. Aaron, uh, excuse me, uh, Shad will be pre presenting first, followed by Aaron. Um, after the presentation, we will open up the conference for your questions, and we will give you additional information at that time. Everyone, please join me in welcoming Dr. Sean Carter, Senior Scientist at the USGS, National Climate Change and Wildlife Science Center in Reston, Virginia. Sean, welcome. Thanks, Ashley. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, our two speakers today in our webinar series. Uh, Dr. Shad O'Neill has worked at, as a research glaciologist at the USGS Alaska Science Center since 2008. He maintains a long-term mass balance observations at two glaciers in Alaska, as well as continuing the long-term record of observation and interpretation at the rapidly retreating Columbia Glacier. His research focuses on mountain glaciers, in particular assessing the relative roles of ice dynamics and surface mass balance. Dr. Aaron Hood is an Associate Professor of Environmental Science at the University of Alaska Southeast. His research interests are in hydrology and aquatic biochemistry. Much of his recent work is focused on improving our understanding of organic matter and nutrient dynamics in the glacial ecosystems and proglacial rivers along the Gulf of Alaska. So without further ado, I guess we'll turn it over to Shad. I'm looking forward to the talk. Thank you. Chad, just press star six to unmute your phone. Hello? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay, okay, great. So um, we'll just jump right in, I guess, to the talk. This is work that has been going on for a couple of years looking at how Glaciers are changing in Alaska and trying to connect them into the whole ecosystem from the high alpine regions of the mountains all the way down into the near shore environment of the, the ocean. And the slides that we're going to show today are really came together in a workshop that Aaron and I hosted in Juneau in March this year. This was funded by the Alaska Climate Science Center and USGS. University of Alaska Southeast, the Alaska Coastal Rainforest Center, and the North Pacific LCC. It brought together a really unique group of both scientists and resource managers and agency managers into the same place for two, two days. And we worked on putting, stitching the science together from both the scientific and the management perspective to try and better understand how the ecosystem is connected especially across the terrestrial nearshore boundary, which is managed quite separately, and the, the managers never really consider the, the transboundary processes going from terrestrial landscape into the, the nearshore ecosystem. So that was our goal to try and study this ecosystem or to conceptualize this ecosystem, but also from a glacier-centric glacier viewpoint. So looking at it, like how are the glaciers both the variability and the change in the glaciers impacting the whole ecosystem. So that's, that's what our goal is to share with you today. Um, so here's an opening slide on our conceptual model of what, what we're trying to do in this research. Um, some of it I just said, but it's the physical and the ecological interaction. So looking at it from a physical science perspective, how the, the biology and the ecology is interacting with the the ecosystem from a glaciological perspective. Um, and forward looking to enhance our um, understanding of what, how to address this ecosystem in the future. And in part that's because there's a lot of um, 
social and economic issues that are sort of revolve around this ecosystem from fishing to, to tourism are the, the two primary ones. And um, I was at a Forest Service um, Chugach assessment for climate change recently, and we were asked, you know, how many glaciers will the tourists be able to see from cruise ships in 30 years? And at first, I just sort of laughed off that question as something that was unattainable, but it's, it actually is a really important question. There's a lot of dollars behind those tourists in the Alaskan economy, and if they're not seeing the glaciers, if they don't get to see iceberg calving from the boat, they're probably not going to be paying the, the day rates of a couple hundred bucks to go out and see Alaska. That's, that's what they're here to see. So it's, it's a really relevant question, and as is the projecting future salmon populations in the Gulf of Alaska, a big part of our economy. So that's sort of the motivation for this work and to try and get the management and the science on the same table so that the scientists aren't wandering off into left field looking at things that the managers could care less about, but also to get the managers on the same table and say, well, this is where the science is at, and try and ask questions that are scaled appropriately for our, our current knowledge. Um, so a little bit of background for those of you who don't know the, the Gulf of Alaska system. I lost the pointer. Um, but I can point for the people here anyways. Can't. Was on the left side? Okay. Um, so uh, the region that we're considering kind of goes from Kodiak all the way down to Vancouver Island. Um, the Gulf of Alaska is a very the coastal ecosystem is very wet. Average annual precip is over two meters a year, and it peaks in Prince William Sound and sort of the middle of it all at over four meters a year of water equivalent. So it's pretty wet. It's the per humid temperate rainforest ecosystem. Um, and ice cover in this region is 15 to 20 percent. Um, and But the runoff from the glaciers is disproportionately large. It's about half of the runoff is coming from, from the glaciers, even though the glaciers are only about 20 percent of the landscape. So right there you're starting to see some, some impact, some way the glaciers are influencing the ecosystem. There's also strong ice ocean interactions that are then coupled into the the ecology of the, the nearshore environment. Um, so nutrients are delivered in the water and they help sort of with primary productivity, which feeds the fish and the birds and us eventually. So and then the ice is also coupled to ocean circulation, especially in Alaska, this coastal current that zips up along the coast is a baroclinic current, so it's driven by density differences between the fresh water coming in and the salt water. In, already in the ocean, and then it's sort of controlled by wind as well. Um, this map on the right-hand side shows where the glaciers are in Alaska. They're colored in blue, and you see that the coast, the Gulf of Alaska coast, is really where the majority of the ice in the state is. So uh, there's a lot of focus on the Arctic right now, and you can see the glaciers in the Arctic up here. They're not that big. So our goal in this research is to really bring focus our attention on the coast range, which has been not studied as extensively as the Arctic, but it's where the, the, there's a lot more so, socioeconomic issues revolving around these glaciers. Um, so what we'll try and do is take you from the glaciers today. Oh, that's not working. Bummer. Let's try the... Okay. This worked a minute ago, but it's not working. Um, we'll go through the glaciers to the streams, look at the geochemistry in the streams, and then how the geochemistry is impacting the ecology. The pointer on. Oh, and then push it? Oh, there's the laser. Okay, yeah, so from the glacier to the streams, look at the chemistry in the streams, make it down to the estuary where the animals that are um, at the core of the ecology are. So that's, that's sort of the, the overview of the, the talk. A couple of motivating examples before we get into the, the details. The first one is just ice loss in Alaska. There's, there's a lot of recent publications documenting sustained ice loss in Alaska. This is the Chugach Range here in Prince William Sound. Um, red colors indicate ice loss, blue colors indicate overall mass change for these glaciers. 
This is Columbia Glacier here. It's a rapid re rapidly retreating tidewater glacier. It's lost about 50% of its total volume in the past 35 years. Right next door in the same climate is Harvard Glacier, which is slowly advancing and thickening in the same climate. Here's the Juneau Ice Field, where we have a similar story. This is Taku Glacier, which has been thickening and advancing over the past several decades. Um, it's changed what was once a fjord into a river system. And then the rest of the glaciers in the ice field, Juneau Ice Field are all thinning and, and losing mass and retreating over the past several centuries. So the, the take home message is that Alaska is losing mass loss. It's um, among the fastest changing glacierized regions on Earth. Um, but it's not all climate. There's a bunch of ice dynamics woven into that signal. And if we're going to make future projections, we have to understand not only the climate, but the, the ice dynamics. So that's um, ice flow, iceberg calving. Those processes are, are substantial uh, players in the, the ice loss story. So a second motivating example is regional runoff. Um, Aaron with Ed Neal spearheaded a study that came out in 2010 in GRL on just the importance of glaciers in the regional runoff. So these numbers up here now just show um, several different large drainage basins. Um, we'll compare southeast Alaska to the Yukon. The Yukon's about five times larger in the Mississippi River, about 20 times larger in aerial extent. But if we look at the, the runoff from these basins, uh, 370 cubic kilometers a year from southeast Alaska is in excess of the Yukon and close to the Mississippi River, even though the areas are much, much smaller. So again, it's just a very wet place. Gulf of Alaska wide, it's about 870 cubic kilometers a year of runoff. About half of that is coming from the glaciers. Um, here's an example of how tidewater glaciers are talking to the ocean. Um, what, what we see happening is that the water from the open ocean comes up over these sills that protect the entrance to the fjords. It's uh, salty, so it sinks down to the bottom, and it's basically dragged along the bottom of the fjord where it mixes with fresh cold water coming out from beneath the tidewater glaciers, and then it rises buoyantly to the top and melts the glacier as, as this process occurs. It's like a thermal pump that's happening. And that process we're finding more and more is, is quite strong. It can basically melt the ice as fast as it's delivered into these fjords. And that can be, these glaciers tend to flow fast when they enter the fjords, so we're talking 15 to 20 meters a day of, of ice can be melted during the summer and fall months. So this is a really strong interaction. It's a two-way street, though. You dump ice out into the fjord, you can change the circulation patterns of the, the, and the thermal structure of the fjord as well. So they can both stay, uh, trigger unstable processes. So that's sort of what motivated our research, and now we'll, we'll walk through these four different components of the ecosystem, starting at the top with the glaciers. And I'll talk about the glaciers and the stream flow and the oceans, and then Aaron's going to talk about the geochemistry and the ecology. So one of the big uh, pushes in glaciology right now is to try and come up with regional estimates of mass change. So I'm just going to talk about how, how we're doing that. The sort of traditional way is through field measurements, um, where we just go directly onto the glacier and we measure mass change at a point and then extrapolate over the whole glacier surface. So the way this is done is by putting stakes into the glacier and measuring uh, height changes on the stake through the, through the season. So in the winter, snow falls and the stake gets shorter. And then in the summer, the snow and ice melts and the stake gets longer. Then we need to know the density of the material, so we dig snow pits and, and calculate the density profile in the snow pit. Um, these are two famous time series for, in glaciology from the Golcana and Wolverine glaciers in Alaska. They're in different, two different climate regimes. Golcana is in the Alaska range, a cold continental climate regime. Wolverine in red is on the coast. You can see these are cumulative uh, Glacier-wide mass balance time series, they start in the mid-1960s at zero, and then you can see the predominant trend is mass loss. The curves are below zero. The glacier's losing material. The, the Y scale is um, a thickness of water averaged over the whole glacier surface to help you visualize it. So Gokana's lost 
25 meters by 2010, averaged over the whole glacier surface. Wolverine on the coast has only lost about 16 meters. And these uh, black points are DM differences that we've done to sort of help ground truth these point measurements. And what you can see is that in the interior, there's been a pretty monotonic decrease in mass, but that's been modulated in the, on the coast in the 1980s, basically, where we had periods of mass gain um, and glacier growth. So taking it from sort of the traditional scale me measurements, um, UAF has, has been championing a program of airborne laser altimetry. It's now a centerline swath LIDAR. And this takes, it has low temporal resolution, but it gets us to a lot more places. So instead of just having a few stakes on a couple of glaciers, we're now getting samples 500 meters wide at about one meter along flow spacing out of the airplane. Um, and you can get a plot like this, where you, this is just for the, the Alaska region, so it spills over into Canada, but this is all the glaciers in Alaska um, from the airplane program, and we see these coarse temporal changes of always losing mass in, in the, since the program started, but accelerated mass loss in the, the early part of the first decade of the 2000s, and then a slight rebound, and now it's down again. So that's the kind of information we can get out of the airplane. And then there's uh, remote sensing observations from space. I'll show some examples from the GRACE satellite, which is up here. This is a these are two satellites, and they have a, a high-precision um, laser, basically, that ranges between the two satellites. The precision is about the width of a human hair. And as those satellites orbit the Earth, they're attracted or uh, repelled from each other, depending on the, what the mass is below them. So when they fly over the ice, they get a little bit further apart, or they get pulled together, and then if the ice goes away, they would be a little bit further apart. From that, we can calculate time series of, of regional mass change of the glaciers. We have to do a lot of sophisticated modeling of uh, terrestrial water storage, um, so groundwater exchanges, uh, snow loading and unloading, stuff like that. To get to this time series, you can actually see the seasonal addition of snow and then removal during the summer in this plot. But you know, the overall trend is one of mass loss going from 2003 to the present. So we come up with a number of minus 66 plus or minus 5 gigatons a year. Sort of an arbitrary um, unit for non-glaciologists. I changed it into something more common. This is 26 and a half million Olympic-sized swimming pools of ice every year. So we're, we're losing quite a bit of substantial amount of ice from, from Alaska on an annual basis. So how do these methods stack up? Our, our goal right now is to try and integrate the field measurements with the airborne measurements with the satellite measurements. So here's a plot that shows for uh, Wolverine Glacier, the annual balance is in the middle, winter balances, so this is snow accumulation, and down here is ice melt in the summertime. Um, comparing the, the snow pit and stake measurements to the, the satellite observations. And this is a one-to-one -one line. If all the measurements fell on the one-to-one -one line, they'd be saying the same thing. So for Wolverine on the coast, where there's lots of ice around our little glacier that we measure, the, set, the gray satellite's doing pretty well. You go up into the Alaska Range or the Brooks Range, where the ice-covered landscape is more sparse and it, it doesn't work so, so well yet. We've also looked at um, <coughs> comparing ISAP to gray. So ISAP's a satellite laser ranger. And here's the tracks of ISAT over Alaska, and here's the comparison from 2003 to 2009 between ISAT and GRACE. So all these different measurements are starting to tell us the same story. We're starting to get a pretty good handle on how glaciers are changing in Alaska. So the, the next step in the system is to take the glacier change and, and try to understand how the runoff is making it into the streams and how the stream flow is affected by, by glacier change. This is a schematic from a paper by Jansen and others in 2003 that sort of conceptualizes how we think the glacier should respond to, to climate change. So you can think of a step change in climate. The easiest is to think about climate warming. You would end up with a change, a, a change in mass balance as a result of that. So that would 
be smoothed out from the climate change. So you change the temperature, the glacier takes a while to, to adjust. And then we would expect there to be a pulse of runoff, sort of a long-term pulse and runoff associated with this net decrease in glacier volume. But then eventually, as the glacier reaches equilibrium, you'd expect runoff to go back to a lower state than it started at. <coughs> Why is it so complicated? Why, why can't we just tell you how much water is coming off the glaciers? It has to do a lot with the subglacial hydraulics. Water is the, the way water is transferred through the glacier is complicated. Um, on top of a lot of the glacier, we've got snow and fern. Fern is just old snow, and that stuff is like a sponge, and the water gets stuck in the sponge and takes a while to, to move through that, that system. Once it gets into the, the ice, there's a network of cracks and tubes and pipes, the plumbing system of the glacier, and that stuff um, is impacted by the, the viscous properties of ice. So during times when there's low pressure in those, the overburden stress will close those pipes down and the pressure changes in the, the pipes. The system evolves through the annual cycle going from a low volume, high pressure system in the spring to a high volume, low pressure system in the fall. And the transit times for a part water particle change dramatically depending on the geometry of the plumbing system. In the end, though, what we see if we look at the stream hydrographs is, is a picture like this. So this is going from January through December, and there's a bunch of river hydrographs here. So um, the ones in the bottom, don't the basins don't have glaciers in them. So we see this snow melt rise and then this decay in, in water flow through the basin as the summer goes on. But for the glacier systems, we see the same rise, early season rise of snow melts, but then as the snow and ice continues to melt through the summer, we get a lot more flux through the, those basins, and it continues later through the summer. And this is a pretty nonlinear system. Of about 5% of the basin becomes glacierized, and you see this really radical change in the hydrograph. So it doesn't take much ice in the basin to get a strong shift in the hydrology. And then here's, here's a plot that I've been putting together at, at the difference between the continental base and the Alaska Range or Switzerland kind of characteristic glaciers versus the coast. Um, so red is Wolverine Glacier Stream on the coast and blue is Gulcana Glacier Stream in the interior. And what you see is a really similar ramp up in the spring. So the, the median flows are shown. This is for all years that the stream gauge has been out. So it's about 30 to 40 years of data. And it's just averaged for all those years by day. We see a really similar snow melt rise. Maximum variability in the interior comes in June and July. That's because the summer forcing is, is stronger there. But then for the coastal system, we see this rain-dominated fall is really what's where the variability comes on the coast. And that doesn't happen in the interior, where most of our intuition about how glaciers interact with stream flow comes from. So trying to bring this science to the coast, we really have to change our perspective and start to think about how precip is really the big, introduces the big variability in the, the coastal systems. We also can see that snow melt and ice melt continues much later in the, the, the fall but in the, along the coast. Um, so one of the goals right now is to try and be able to predict how runoff from glaciers is going to evolve over the next decades to century for, for water resource management. To do this, this is all that each one of these circles represents a module that would have to go into a model to be able to predict runoff from a glacier. So you not only need to know the total moisture going in, evapotranspiration, how much ice is melting, um, what kind of vegetation, and the snow accumulation and melt patterns on a spatial scale through the basin. You also have to be able to evolve the glacier over time and let the glacier geometry change in time over decades. The, the footprint of glaciers and the vegetation changes associated with the changing footprint make substantial difference. This level of modeling isn't really available to us right now, but we're starting to get there. So the guys from UBC have set this up for this is uh, the Columbia River at Mica Dam. And the black here is data, and then we have two different model ensembles that go out to 2100. The red is with a dynamic glacier and the blue is with a static glacier. So the blue is sort of state of the art right now and red is experimental technology where the glacier geometry changes as we, we move forward in time. 
And you can see that there's divergence between the two curves. There's a downward trend in either curve. So for that, that glacier system, we're over the crest of the long-term hydrograph. We're starting to reduce water output from um, climate warming. But by the end, 80 years out or so, there's 30 to 40 percent difference between these two projections. And if you're trying to manage a reservoir, that's a substantial difference and one that we'd rather not play or gamble so much on. So this is sort of a direction that we're moving with, with glacier stream flow modeling. Um, so quickly, a few slides on the ocean. <clears throat> this is a beautiful satellite image, and you can see all this fresh water coming out of the rivers in the Gulf of Alaska and making it into the, the ocean. And that's going to be important not only for the oceanography, but for the geochemistry that, that Aaron will talk about. One of the big things to, that we're learning about the ocean is it's, the interannual variability is high. It's probably in excess of the trends. So here's some figures from Peter Windsor looking at the Seward line, which is a, a, a long-standing measurement line going off the, into Prince William Sound, comparing two years water temperature, salinity, and nitrogen. And you can see, especially for temperature, that there's just really strong interannual variability in the, in, the, in the ocean. We're starting to get a lot better handle on what's happening in the ocean with new technology, both these drifters, which are just cast overboard and then they drift around in the currents and make measurements for a long period of time, and then these autonomous vehicles. And they tell us a lot. This is an experiment in the near shore, so very shallow water. And you get an idea of how the temperature is varying. You can see this stratification. Here's the salinity. Again, there's pretty strong horizontal stratification. For chlorophyll, you can start to see these little plankton blooms happening. Um, so the technology is just en enabling really rich data sets is the point of that, that slide. And then one of the, the components of the ecosystem that's that's really poorly understood, but, but quite important are the, are the fjords in Alaska. The tidewater glaciers are, have their homes in the fjords. These are the glaciers that have these instabilities that can change glacier inputs to sea level rise and, and fresh water runoff very quickly. There's a lot of life living in the ocean, and we're, we're trying to understand how, why do you see seals, birds, and um, whales and stuff in the fjords, and how does the how does the ocean talk to the glacier? So both looking at the physics and the, the biology here. So this is an, a recent example from um, Icy Bay, where we did a bunch of CTD casts, both at the entrance sill and then all the way up towards Yahtzee Glacier. Um, and I'm just going to summarize this plot. This is a temperature salinity plot, and you can basically fingerprint where the water is coming from. Um, in this region, we know that the water is a mix of seawater and freshwater discharge from the glacier. And these um, waters are being sampled at depth. And down here in this region, you're basically looking at seawater and ice melt only. And that stuff is all sitting on the top. So it's, that provides evidence that the seawater is mixing with the discharge and melting the glacier and then exiting at the, the surface of the fjord. <coughs> And the way that you look at the fluxes of this stuff, this is a, a, a submarine melt flux curve here. And we see that it peaks in September, which is probably later than you would expect. And then it's a substantial um, melt rates, submarine melt rates at tidewater glaciers are, are substantial for about six months a year, basically. So we're, we lose a lot of mass by melting, by bringing the warm ocean water in direct contact with the glacier. And then, is leading us to um, figure out how, how to model the, the fjord circulation. Is it just a shallow circulation? Is it full depth circulation? Or do you think it's somewhere in between? OK. I've kind of talked too long, but I'll just move to Aaron. OK, thanks, Shad. Um, so I'm going to talk a little about uh, biogeochemistry and also ecology related to glacier systems. And this. Uh, First shot is a picture of me. It looks like I'm perched on the edge of a waterfall, but actually it's not a dangerous spot. Um, sampling the outflow of the Mendenhall Glacier near Juneau. And the purpose of this is that we've done a lot of work to try to understand what 
this sort of unique biogeochemical signature of glacier systems is. Because if we think about glaciers as an ecosystem, an ice-dominated ecosystem, they're very different from most terrestrial ecosystems that have been better studied in terms of the biogeochemistry. And so what we're fundamentally trying to understand is, is this water that's coming out of glaciers, how is it different? How is that going to affect streams and aquatic ecosystems, both in the freshwater and in the nearshore uh, marine? Okay, so a little overview on glacier ecosystems. Most people don't think of glaciers as ecosystems. They think of them as static, frozen blocks of ice that are, that are contributing water downstream, but actually they're quite vibrant ecosystems. And some of the, from a biogeochemical perspective, some of the important um, characteristics are that they receive atmospheric deposition on the surface so we can get nutrients and contaminants and other things that are deposited in the snow load on the glacier surface. We have uh, primary productivity and heterotrophic productivity, so there's a lot of microbial activity on the surface. I'll show some pictures of that. There's also a lot going on underneath the glacier. There's organic matter that's left from times when the glaciers receded back. You get forests and organic soils growing up, and then the glacier readvances, and so you actually have organic matter underneath the glacier. You have weathering processes going on. You have microbial pr communities, so there's a lot going on underneath that. And then in the region where we are, there's actually a lot of contributions from the side. So we get water and nutrients and things off of the hill slopes. So we have these forested hill slopes. They're contributing water down in here. And so all of that mixed together is the signature that we're getting out of the bottom of the glacier. And actually, that last picture where I was sampling the Mendenhall Glacier is now the terminus is right here. And that waterfall I'm standing on is right on this cliff right there. So all of this is gone in the last six years or so that we've lost. Okay, so uh, just kind of a tour of some of the environments. What are we talking about in terms of environments here? So superglacial environment, the, the, main, uh, the main sort of environment is what are called these cryokinite holes. And so these are mineral deposits with a lot of algal material. So it's this dark material that melts down into the glacier. They're essentially little ponds. And there's all, kind of, all kinds of algae and microbes that are living in this pond, that are doing fixing carbon from the atmosphere, they're photosynthesizing, they're respiring carbon dioxide out, and then the products of, of that uh, biota are being exported out of the ponds in streams, which eventually go into Mulans underneath the glacier and are exported out. So in this superglacial environment, we're looking again to measure a lot about atmospheric deposition of different things. And we're also interested in better understanding these microbial habitats. How much activity is there? How are they modifying the inputs that are coming into the top of the glacier and then sending that to the subglacial environments? The subglacial environments are actually a lot harder to study. And this is kind of like an example. The glaciers sort of peel back here. And so you can see all this soil and sediment in the, the basal zone. We now have a lot of work by Mark Skidmore and others that have looked through boreholes and things and sampled down to the bottom of the glacier, and there's really a lot of microbial communities there. It's very microbially active underneath the glacier, and so uh, it's hard to study, but what we know is that the, the inputs that are coming in from the top are being modified at the bottom of the glacier before they come out. And so understanding these processes of, well, what are the inputs from the supraglacial, and then how are they modified? Uh, underneath the glacier is going to tell us a lot about what's coming out of the glacier. And so that signature that we get that's being exported to the rivers and the near shore downstream is definitely being impacted by the residence time and the sort of bio, uh, biogeochemical processes that are going on underneath glaciers. Okay, so if we go downstream from the glacier, we can start looking at sort of some simple examples of the physical uh, impact of runoff from glaciers. So this example right here is showing a series of watersheds in southeast Alaska, and this is the percentage of the watershed that's covered by glaciers. So a, a watershed with no glacier to one that's half covered, you know, completely glacial dominated. So if we look at just the temperature signature of the water, we can see in the, the non-glacial or low glacial streams, they warm up a lot during the summer. In the glacial streams, in contrast, the peak temperature is in late May or early June, and then all summer they get colder because the glacier turns on. And so we have a really strong dichotomy in terms of the temperature, and that's important because temperature obviously influences metabolism of organisms in 
aquatic ecosystems. And we can even actually see some very subtle diversions. This is in August right here. This, this watershed has some glaciers up at the headwaters, and we had a warm period of a week, and you can see the, the stream with no glacier warms up a couple degrees. Well, this one with just a little bit of glacier cover actually got colder, and stream flow came up during that period. And so glaciers can really buffer both the temperature and the runoff uh, in these streams. Okay, and just another example, turbidity here, so water clarity or light penetration, we see the opposite. So this is on a log scale, and so basically the, the streams that have no or little glacier coverage are, have relatively clear water, and then we have a lot of, uh, of glacial flour being delivered into the water, so there's a lot of turbidity. It's highly variable because the release of this uh, glacial flower isn't necessarily correlated directly with discharge like you see in non-glacial rivers. So just a sense of how you, the physical structure of these uh, rivers that are impacted by glaciers is very different. Okay, what about biodiversity? So if we look at these glacier, the rivers that are down in front of the glaciers here, this is a, a recent paper that was published and the point was to look at the impact of glaciers on taxonomic richness in glacial rivers. And what they found is, and this is, so they looked at streams in Alaska and the Andes and in the Alps, and in all of these cases, if you're heavily glacialized, so this GCC is the, the glacial coverage in the catchment, so if your watershed is dominated by glaciers, you have pretty low richness because it's a very cold, very turbid, very harsh environment, and so there's only a certain subset of organisms that can live there. As the glaciers become a smaller part of the watershed, the richness increases, and it actually peaks somewhere about 5 to 30 percent glacial coverage, and then it goes back down again when you lose the glaciers completely. And so this tells us that in terms of both the physical and the biogeochemical structure of the system, that having some glacier in there contributes the sort of heterogeneity that adds some richness to these glacier systems. Okay, organic carbon is something that we don't usually associate with glaciers. We usually associate organic carbon with wetlands and organic soils. And so this is essentially, if you, if you make tea, that's organic carbon, right? It's very important for heterotrophic microbes because that's the, the energy source for them. Well, it turns out that when we've looked at glacier ecosystems, they're actually pumping out a lot of organic carbon to downstream systems. And that's eventually going to you know, be put forward up into the higher uh, trophic level. So by sampling these glacier rivers, what we can do is look at the concentrations of organic carbon that's coming out. We can look, look at the stream flow and we multiply that together and we get a mass export. And so for example, for the Mendenhall Glacier here, it's exporting about 12 to 18 kilograms of carbon per hectare of glacier area per year, which is, in, you know, a, probably doesn't mean a lot to you in terms of an absolute number, but just for the sake of comparison, if we look at the boreal forest and we compare the carbon export from a whole bunch of watersheds, which is another, you know, northern ecosystem, it's somewhere on the order of 22 to 86 kilograms per carbon per hectare per year, okay? And so the take-home message there is that if you looked at this ecosystem and you looked at this ecosystem, you would say, well, there's a ton more carbon in here coming out there, but per unit area, a glacier is actually about at the low end of what you get from a boreal forest ecosystem. And the primary reason for that, for that is that the water fluxes from glaciers are so much higher that even with a low concentration of carbon, you can actually push out a reasonable amount of mass flux. The other critical point here is that because the carbon here is not plant-derived, it's actually much more biologically available to heterotrophic microbes. And so when we've done experiments where we incubate and we feed the carbon from these kind of watersheds and these kind of watersheds to the microbes, they'll readily metabolize the carbon coming out of the glacier watershed, a much larger percentage of it, because they're less structurally complex molecules that aren't really plant-derived. Plant Okay, glaciers are also an important source of iron, and this slide is from work done by uh, John Crucius and Andrew Schroth uh, along mostly in the Copper River area. And so basically the, the iron is important in terms of a limiting micronutrient in marine environments, and so we can get iron from glaciers directly in this glacial flower. So in the plume we have dissolved and colloidal and particulate forms 
of iron. We can also get cases where we have resuspended glacial flowers. The storm come in, the glacial flowers settled out, you resuspend it, and you can dissolve iron from there. And then another example is from dust storms. And so there's all these areas that have been deglaciated where there's a lot of glacial flowers sitting around. There's not that much vegetation. And so when we get these strong outflow winds, that can push all the dust out into the ocean, and then that's also acting as a source of iron. Well, why is iron important? In this case, it's important because in this nearshore region, what we have are these uh, high nitrogen, low chlorophyll waters, and they're basically mixing in here, and then when we get these iron inputs, we can get very high uh, primary productivity. So you can see these blooms of plankton. So that's an important input uh, in terms of the, the glacier water that's coming in. And so here's a shot of that there, and you can see all this uh, chlorophyll, phytoplankton production here uh, in these kind of near shore regions. And then ultimately, there's a pretty strong correlation between chlorophyll A concentration and resident fish yield. And so basically, it's just sort of a, a metric of productivity in these systems, and iron can play an important role in that productivity. All right, but there's also potentially bad news to look at, and that is you know, how are glacier ecosystems responding to inputs of contaminants? So there's the Grim Reaper right there. Um, and there's been a number of studies recently that are starting to look at this idea that glaciers are more of flow-through systems compared to forested and other terrestrial systems because they don't have soils and other places to stabilize contaminants. And so here's uh, persi POPs, persistent organic pollutants, from glaciers and then DDT and the Antarctic ecosystem from glaciers. And so the point being that some of the contaminants that are being transported up to these higher latitude areas can get onto the glaciers and then be coming out the bottom of the glaciers. It, we also need to look at the uh, glacier dynamics are important. And so this is kind of a profile shot of a glacier. And the, the basic idea is depending where you're depositing stuff on the glacier surface, if you deposit it up at the highest elevation, the flow line will be longer, and so it might take 100 years for it to get through the whole system. If you deposit material down near the equilibrium line, it might have a shorter flow path and be coming up to the surface after only 25 years. And so there's actually cases that they've seen in Europe where the equilibrium line changes and the contaminants that are deposited are kind of leapfrogging each other because if you deposit contaminants up here, they're going to be sitting in the glacier and not come out for a long time. Whereas if you deposit them down here, they have a much shorter transit time. And the end, the kind of upshot of this is these looking at uh, sediment cores in lakes. And so this dark line right here, which I've circled in red, is a lake that has a glacier above it. And so you see during the kind of uh, 50s and 60s that there was a, a high level of contaminants going into the sediments and all these things. And they have pollution controls. And then everything comes back down. And then we have this sort of delay, and then all of a sudden in the, in the glacier-fed lake, we see the contaminants going up again in the soils, and that's basically reflecting the transit time through the glacier. And so glaciers have this memory that allows them to store the contaminants and release them at a later time period. So that's something we need to think about. In terms of Alaska and the Gulf of Alaska in general, um, one of the interesting uh, points is that we're looking at now a lot is mercury. And there's reason to believe, if you look at these atmospheric transport models, that China is the biggest emitter of mercury, and a lot of the plume ends up coming over in our direction. And so we're starting to look at the deposition of that on glaciers and um, the extent to which that is coming out the bottom of these glaciers. And it's actually not, uh, I wouldn't say it's high, but it's also not insubstantial from looking at the initial results we have in terms of mercury from glacier outflows. Okay, so hopefully I've convinced you that runoff from glaciers is unique among terrestrial ecosystems. It has very bioavailable organic matter at higher levels than you would think. Uh, there are nutrients like phosphorus, which I really didn't talk much about, but it's a rock-derived element, so you can get actually reasonable phosphorus fluxes simply because of the mechanical weathering that goes on with glaciers. Micronutrients such as iron, and then we're also looking more at contaminants. And so the, the upshot of this is that the signal that comes out of that glacier water is biogeochemically very unique compared to 
water from forested ecosystems or other type of terrestrial ecosystems. Okay, ecology, I'll, I'll start by saying I'm not an ecologist, but I have some slides. Here's a, a nice breaching whale. Um, but we are trying to make the, uh, we're trying to link down, because that's ultimately the question, right? If the biogeochemistry of these things is different, how is that impacting <coughs> ecology downstream? And this is, uh, this is work that was done by Yumi Aramitsu, who's at uh, USGS and UAF uh, in Glacier Bay. And so it's looking at zooplankton and euphalases, which is basically krill and plankton. And surprisingly, from these tow surveys that they've done in the bay, they see very high concentrations. So this is the upper bay right here that's completely glacial dominated. So if you look at a picture of Glacier Bay, it's green down here. The glaciers have retreated all the way up the bay since the end of the life age. There's still tidewater or near tidewater glaciers at the headwaters of the bay. And despite the fact that it's dominated by this dark, turbid, cold water, there's very high concentrations of some of these zooplankton up here. Uh, and so obviously there's something in this system that, that, the, that the biota are thriving on. Uh, there's also been a lot of work done on uh, seabirds and basically the, what Shad talked about in terms of that circulation that goes on in these fjords and that upwelling is very important because the submarine glacier discharge at the tidewater glaciers, which is discharging underneath and then resulting in the upwelling, you have the mixing, there's mortality of zooplankton by the osmotic shock from the fresh water, and so that stuff's all coming up to the surface, and so you see very high bird populations at the face of these tidewater glaciers. Again, sort of an ecological impact of these uh, glacier systems. Harbor seals is another example. Harbor seals have very high fidelity to glacier habitat. They provide refuge from predation, both in terms of them being able to haul out and also acoustically, uh, apparently the, all the noise from the icebergs moving around and the calving and stuff like that actually interferes with the acoustics of orcas that are trying to hunt for the field so that they do better in these. They're also very import, important for uh, pupping in terms of uh, seal habitat. So understanding how uh, sort of iceberg calving dynamics are influencing habitat for seals. And then if we think about the ecological patterns, there's actually some very uh, sort of unique patterns that people are seeing. So this is, I'm going to say it's a candlefish because that's my memory, which is a, basically a forage fish. And so the normal uh, routine for these is that they come up to shallower depths at night and then they migrate down deeper during the day. But what they see in the glacier systems is that there's so little light penetration that they actually just stay near the surface, close to the surface all the time. And then some of the, the toes that they're doing, that might be why they're getting higher abundances, is because the stuff that normally has sort of a photo migrates by the photo period is just staying up near the surface because there's not as much light. But it also gets to the question of what, in terms of the structure of the food web, how is it different? So here's the standard structure, right? We have the high phytoplankton production, which is raised on by zooplankton and then consumed by forage fish and then on up the chain. Well, here, if we go to the glacier ecosystem, we don't have much light availability in those glacier-dominated fjords because of all the glacial flour. And so phytoplankton production is actually very low, but there's still a high abundance of zooplankton. And so we're doing work right now to try to understand uh, what is supporting that. Part of it could be heterotrophic productivity because of all the uh, bioavailable carbon coming out of the glaciers, but we really don't know. We do know that we can have high concentrations of zooplankton and forage fish, even though right at, near the glaciers, the, the amount of phytoplankton production is actually relatively pretty low. Okay, so to summarize uh, where, what we've showed you here. So basically, you know, as Shad pointed out at the beginning, we're really trying to think of this ice field to ocean ecosystem in a more comprehensive sort of holistic way. And so if we start up at the top, we have climate drivers which are influencing the glacier volume dynamics. That's influencing the amount of flow. And so the hydrology has changed. And not only the hydrology, the biogeochemistry, because it's, it's a unique biogeochemistry, that comes into these nearshore marine systems and it influences 
the circulation in terms of these density-driven coastal currents. It also, which both the physical changes in terms of the currents and also sort of the biogeochemistry can have influence on productivity in marine ecosystems. And then if we go to the tidewater glaciers, we have these feedbacks between the glaciers and the ocean, right, talking to each other. And so the dynamics of ice loss in these systems is a result of these ice ocean feedbacks. Uh, there's the calving glaciers. And then those provide habitat for uh, other organisms. And then ultimately, you know, we have all these socioeconomic concerns as well in terms of tourism and things like that. And Shad gave that example of, you know, how many glaciers are we going to be able to see? Well, that is actually an important question that we need to be thinking about. All right, so thinking about the glacier influence on the ecosystem, uh, glaciers are vibrant ecosystems. We don't think of them that way. We think of a forest as a vibrant ecosystem, but actually glaciers have a relatively high productivity for, for what they are. They have a really pronounced influence on stream flow volume, seasonality, and variability. They can supply a sort of unique suite of nutrients to downstream either freshwater or marine ecosystems. The Alaska Coastal Current, again, is driven by freshwater because it's a density-driven uh, current. And then ultimately, what we need to better understand is how are freshwater and marine food webs being influenced by glaciers. And so if you go back to that slide that Chad had of glacier runoff over the next 100 years, depending where you are, you're going to have more glacier runoff or you're going to have less glacier runoff. And there's this tipping point. And so some areas, we're going to see an increase in runoff in the coming decades. Some areas, they've already gone over that tipping point we're going to see a decrease. But either way, if we understand better how the glacier runoff is tied into these downstream food webs, we'll be able to make some better uh, predictions. And then finally, glacier change is going to have economic impacts on fisheries and hydropower and uh, tourism, certainly. And so kind of, again, trying to think about this in a more holistic way, I think it's going to be much more productive than everyone studying the little piece of the puzzle in isolation. All right, and with that, I think we're finished. I'd be happy to take any questions for Chef Wood as well. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Shatter, Aaron, could you please bring us back to the uh, screen where we can see the participant list in the chat box by pressing the stop button? Uh, yeah. Does that work? Um, could you do it one more time? <laughs> I can see all the panelists or okay. participants. Is that Maybe mine just didn't go back. Um, so if you're not on to our participants, if you're not there with the uh, with the participants in the chat box, bring yourself back by clicking the return button, the big blue button there. It looks like it works for many people in the in the chat box. There, letting me know. Thank you very much. All right, um, we're going to open up the conference to questions. To ask your question, if you could please select the raise hand icon that is located between the participant list and the chat box. Um, I will call on you by name when it's time to ask your question. Um, please note that we do have a global mute on, so you'll have to unmute your own phone and then press star six to remove the global mute. Also, um, you can text chat your questions. Just type them into the chat box, and I'll read them aloud to get them into the audio record. So thank you again, uh, Shad and Aaron, for your presentation. And our first question will be from Bruce Marcotte, and he says, in the graph of the indexed taxon richness, biodiversity versus percent glaciation, what taxa were included? I don't actually know specific taxa, unfortunately. You'd have to look at I, I'd be happy to send you the paper. My contact information is here because I didn't do that study. It was all macroinvertebrates, and beyond that, I couldn't tell you exactly what taxa they were looking at. I'd have to go back and look at the paper. So. Okay, thank you. Are there any more questions? Yeah, we have a local question.
question. Is that yeah. That'll that's perfect. From Go ahead. Andrew, how do you know that your zooplankton production is actually localized there at the face of the glacier and not just that it's entrained up the fjord and there are really zooplankton that are dependent on chlorophyll from other areas? And then the currents that you're talking about just bring them to that location. That's another hard question. Uh, <laughs> In at the bottom. Of yeah, the that's the one thing is that they'd have to be coming in the bottom of the fjord and then up to the top. But there are zooplankton that are deeper are depth. Yeah. Yeah, and they vertically migrate, so they could get swept when they are down at depth during the day. Yeah, and and you know, I I actually I don't know. I mean, I think you're not they're not seeing it at other places, so it would have to be stuff that was at deeper depths that was coming up there. But they're doing vertical sampling in other places as well, and they're not seeing it. So it would have to there would have to be a reason why or a mechanism by which it became concentrated there relative to the other places that it was coming from because. I mean, it looks like they're just sampling, and it basically there's a big grid that they're sampling there. Right. And they're not picking it up in most of the places, so it'd have to. But we see the same thing with fronts in the ocean, where it might not be that everything is produced right there, but it's definitely yeah. concentrated yeah. as a hot spot, so it yeah. could act yeah. just like a front. Yeah. yeah. But it's still the end result is the same. There's, there's food available there. Right, but it so would that would make sense the, why yeah. you don't have many phytoplankton, but you do production. have yeah, lots yeah, of yeah, those. Yeah, and it yeah, doesn't matter to the, the fish, right? Yeah. If they right. just want the zooplankton. Yeah. Yeah. And how about a non-ecology question? <laughs> <laughs> I don't have any. Okay. <laughs> okay, we got another local question. Okay. So, well, I, I mean, it's actually more of a nuts and bolts question. When you're talking about the mercury and the iron and the phosphorus. Is, do you have ways to trace where they're coming from so that you know they're coming from the glacier versus other sources? And how far have you traced that, like, into the near shore or into the streams that you're looking at? Well, most of the work that we've done thus far is the sort of ended at salt water because I don't usually do. So we're basically looking at river fluxes and the. The way that we've done it is to look at gradients in glacier coverage, and so that allows us to say, okay, this stream, which has no glacier, but is the next watershed over, so it's receiving the same amount of precipitation, the elevation range is similar, that sort of thing. I mean, you obviously can't control all the differences, but you can start to see if it's on the same type of bedrock, the same basic ecosystem, what the differences are. Another thing that we're doing is sampling, actually, the inputs to the glacier and then the direct output to the glacier, okay. and then down at the river. So we can't entirely control for those things, but much more in the glacier system. We're trying to sample all the pieces and say, okay, what's going in? What do we see in the superglacial streams? And then what's coming out the bottom? And also using a lot more isotopic tracers recently to try to sort of identify things in terms of the unique isotopic signatures. I was trying to stay away from the ecology, but really my interest is how could you trace that carbon into Well, the yeah, actually the main way that I didn't talk about is that it, it, the carbon from the glacier ecosystems has an ancient C14 age, which is a really unique tracer, and it's what's not clear right now entirely. So the carbon is actually very old. If you carbon date it, the carbon age is thousands of years old but yet it's highly bioavailable, which is exactly backwards from what you'd expect, because in most rivers, if the carbon is old, it's old because nothing wanted to metabolize it, and so it's what's left over. <laughs> so we have this sort of paradox with glacier rivers. What's not clear is if there's a small percentage of it that's making the bulk age old, or if it's a large percentage of it is old and bioavailable. And so we're actually sampling, doing a lot of food web sampling now to see if we can see that signature in the food web, and I, I sort of doubt that we will in a way, but I don't, I don't know, and and so that's that's one tracer that we're looking at right now. Hey, I have a question. Okay. 
Hello, this is uh, uh, Becky Long in Talkeetna, Alaska, and I uh, turned into this very, very interesting uh, uh, report on the glacier because I am interested in, I'm with the Coalition for Susitna Dam Alternatives, and we are looking at the studies that they're doing on the glacier runoff into the proposed Susitna Dam Reservoir. And so my question to you is, is do you have any uh, project or any uh, uh, examples you could point me to where uh, what's happening with the glaciers is having some uh, impacts on current hydropower projects? Thank you. There, there's a group um, funded by the state that's starting to study the Susitna Glacier a little bit, but um, that's the only thing that I'm aware of that's directly investigating the Susitna for hydropower. There, there's not like any other hydropower systems that are where the reservoirs are di driven by uh, uh, glaciers, oh. glacier-fed systems that are that you know of that are starting to have some serious uh, concerns with the impacts. Well, there, there's a lot in Europe and Scandinavia. There, there's a big concern there in terms of hydropower. I actually went to a glacier conference in Europe, and there was a huge number of employees of hydropower companies at this conference, which I didn't understand at first. But so that's a big concern there. But the real question that you're getting at is, where are you on that uh, on that curve? Because in some areas, if you lose volume, you're increasing generation capacity for some period of time, and then eventually your generation capacity is going to go down once you cross the tipping point. But I'd look. I'd look to Scandinavia and Europe because they have a lot of glacierized regions that are hydropower producing. Thank you very much. Very interesting discussion. I learned a lot, especially about uh, the biochemistry, et cetera, et cetera, of coming out of the glacier systems. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I know I noticed that some people are signing off, so if you'd like to listen to the recorded version of this, it'll be posted in one to two weeks, and that link is on the announcement that you received. Um, but we do have some more questions. Um, a lot of backed up heavily on the <laughs> questions of <laughs> all about phytoplankton, which is unfortunate. <laughs> <laughs> black. Yes. Uh, is there is the lack of phytoplankton as the base of the food web and fjords unique in ocean systems, or are there other examples? There's probably someone in this room who could answer that question for me. Hydrothermal vents. Um, <laughs> yeah. From what I understand, again, most of this work, if you're interested in that, the whole phytoplankton, zooplankton, stuff, Yumi Aramitsu, who's at USGS and UAF, that all that work is, is her PhD thesis, and so she would be a much better person to ask, and anyone is welcome to email me and I could put you in contact with her because I don't know the answer to that question. I would say, I would think it was unique, but I don't know for sure. Well, there's chemosynthesis yeah. down at depth yeah, yeah, but that, the yeah. Yeah. But as in a but that's a pretty unique Right. Specialized case as well. Actually, yeah. some upwelling systems can have really low phytoplankton just because it's constantly getting pulled offshore. So, like, and the oh, okay. near shore coast of California, they can yeah. be really low because it's constantly yeah. you don't see it. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a difference between like standing stock versus how fast it's turn it's turning over. Uh, okay. So am I? From, so there's another phytoplankton question here. Uh, we missed why it is that it makes sense that there would be less phytoplankton close to the glaciers. There's just no light penetration. Yeah, so the, the, the lack of phytoplankton is light penetration. What else are they feeding on? And that was the question we were debating here is we don't know or maybe they're being imported from somewhere else. Maybe they're feeding on phytoplankton somewhere else and being carried in or there's something else like heterotrophic productivity that's at least in part sustaining them. Uh, okay. 
Let's see. For the Gulf of Alaska area, is there an average glacier recession rate or mass balance loss rate? And if you could project forward, what would the area look like 30 years from now? I'll let Chad. So the average rate is 26 and a half million Olympic sized swimming pools per year. Um, and projecting forward is complicated because of the changes in ice dynamics. So going 30 years forward, we expect glaciers to be thinner, some of the glaciers to have smaller footprints, and we really don't. There, there will probably be more late calving glaciers, um, but in terms of the tidewater glaciers, so getting projecting a mass loss rate is complex because we don't have a handle on the rapid changes possible from the tidewater glaciers. But I would say there, right now there's 12 glaciers in Alaska that are advancing. 100% of those are tidewater glaciers, and I would speculate that we'll see a decrease in the number of advancing glaciers and an increase in the number of retreating glaciers. Well, I mean, 12 out of how many? Out, out, of out of 12 out of a quarter million. Yeah, so, so it's a low number anyway. Yeah. <laughs> but they're big glaciers, some of them. All right, I don't see any other chat questions. We do have one from Susan Walker. In your hydrograph of receding glaciers, which shows an increase in stream flow and then tapering until equilibrium. Can you discuss where on the hydrograph elastic interior glaciers are currently, such as the Gulkin? Did you guys just answer this? Yeah. I don't think we really know yet. There's not, there's not a continuous stream flow record for any of those rivers, so it's really hard to, to pin that down. Yeah, as a, as a very general rule of thumb, if the glacierized area of your watershed is above 10%, there's a good chance that you're still going on the upward side of that. And then if you, as you get below 10% and then eventually lose the glacier, you're definitely going to have a lower water yield. Um, and so certainly some of the heavily glacierized systems are really going to be going up in stream flow for a while, but in areas where you have a lot of small cirque glaciers and things like that, you might already be on the back end. But it's really watershed specific, so that rule of thumb I'm giving is just sort of a way to conceptualize it and take a guess about where you might be. Is there another, let's see. Yes, we have another one from Bruce um, Marcotte. Tracking elevation changes upslope in the ablation zone. If so, what are the trends? Um, yeah, that's a. We're getting better at measuring thickness change of glaciers over large regions. That's basically how the the altimetry program and then the ice sat satellite work. Um, the trends are predominantly thinning, except for surging glaciers and the 12 advancing glaciers. Um, the rates increased in the late 1980s and have been fairly sustained since then. Um, and then there are a substantial number of outliers, which are the calving glaciers, which can be thinning in, over an order of magnitude faster than a terrestrial glacier. And those are, those are sort of the big picture trends for thickness changes. Okay, thank you. And I am not seeing any more questions. So, Sean or Holly, did you have any closing remarks? Uh, nothing except thank you for uh, a really informative and wonderful uh, set of talks. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you again um, to Holly, Sean, Shad, and Aaron. Um, and also, I'd like to just announce that our next webinar is going to be on May 9th at 2.30 p.m. Eastern. And this is the second part of the series um, 
Yingfang Song and Damon Kruger, both postdoctoral researchers at Michigan State University, and Bill Herb, a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Minnesota in Duluth, will be presenting on fish habitat and climate change, a coarse scale national assessment with finer scale assessments of Midwestern streams and lakes. So please watch for an announcement. Again, that will be on May 9th at 2.30 and Holly will be sending you all the link once this webinar is edited, captioned, um, and posted to their website. Thank you all again for your attendance.